from all this comes is this. So Darby Gatron is not only a new act, a uh, new oral anticoagulant. In fact, what has happened is recently it also became a off-patented NOAC as well. So what it means is a lot of those uh, other countries, what is its best thing, what is going to happen is since it has gone off-patent, so price-wise it is going to be much cheaper. And then the best thing is uh, a lot of other people uh, need not spend so much of money what they have been spending so far trying to buy this medicine. So this is literally the first new oral anticoagulant which has gone off the patent list actually. And I'm sure you would have been aware of uh, the earlier formulation which was coming from Boehringer in fact. So we are going to talk about the slide in uh, various subheadings initially about how do we manage how the newer oral anticoagulants actually have changed the way in which we use it what about the guidelines say and we'll discuss so we all know that we are some of the favorite anticoagulants everywhere which is available is vitamin k antagonists like the warfarin or even the acinocumarol or comedin derivatives but they do have some problems so what are those problems is response is very much unpredictable the therapeutic range is narrow so only if the INR is between two to three or maybe you know especially for the mechanical prosthetic heart valves like 2.5 to 3.5 or within a certain range only the therapeutic window is there so it's really narrow and in fact you always need to keep on monitoring by other tests like the INR or all those kind of tests. Similarly, so you need to keep on adjusting as well how is the patient doing so you need to keep on getting the tested again and again. And similarly when you are trying to uh, start a patient on warfarin, it takes time. Uh, for the INR to get built up and that is the re one of the other reasons as well why you try to give a bridging therapy in fact and yes it does have a lot of numerous food to drug interactions similarly even drug to drug interactions as well and we all know there are problems with needing for such drugs and uh, there are some studies as well which show that warfarin has been associated with one of the maximum causes of death which were being in therapeutic range itself. So the number is, has been huge. We all had been asking for many more parameters and many more things as well. Those things we all have been telling that okay whatever alternative ever is coming then it, that alternative needs to be at least as efficacious to warfarin it needs to have a better safety profile at least huh? uh, than warfarin especially in relation to important parameters as intracranial hemorrhage then the response or even the dosing should be a little bit simpler therapeutic range needs to be wide for example if you're giving it like this you are not titrate you need not maintain something and all like this and then intra-patient variability for example to maintain INR between two to three for one patient even one milligram is enough but for other patient even three milligram can be problematic so that kind of problem should not be there similarly if you are trying to give that medicine with her other medicines like antidepressant or quinidine or even with cytochrome p450 uh, getting more of, so there are a lot of drugs uh, in common practice which gets metabolized with cytochrome p450 mediation so those drugs also tend to get affected so that is why what we really want is we do not want such kind of drug to drug interactions and even with the food to drug interactions as well and we want yes when you have given immediately we want the action to happen and we do not want any adverse reaction in fact as well so how do we do that? So that was the reason how the new oral anticoagulants has come up.
these limitations of the war front, there was a need for newer oral anticoagulants. So way back in 2013 itself with my colleagues in the Netherlands and uh, Australia, we were trying to work about accumulation of those data because dabigatran was the first new NUAC actually which had come and we were having a lot of experience as well with that. So that's why we published it in one of these uh, topmost cardiology journals and when we wrote it, to, when we got it published as well, the editor himself said it, why not try to accumulate more data also from the other NUACs like the Dabig uh, river oxaban actually so later on we try to accumulate the data even from this as well so these uh, that's how we got into publication of these two so i'll be showing you some more slides as well from these two of my publications and i would really request you guys to go through the two publications if you guys are having any problem in uh, getting the copy right back to me as well so so when we are trying to do uh, this analysis, so if you may really try, you can have a look. When we try to compare river oxavan versus the vitamin K antagonists, yes, it still tends to favor for the vitamin K antagonists. However, for the river oxavan versus dabigatran, it is almost equal. So the positive effects outcomes are almost equal. Similarly, even on parameters for the strokes as well, it slightly is favoring the river oxaban, but not too much. It's not so much as well. Similarly, I think being cardiologists, we all are very much a bit scared about pericardial tamponade. Pericardial tamponade, what happens is, uh, maybe when you are doing a percutaneous intervention or even ablations as well, or even coronary stent uh, interventions as well. So tamponade can happen, in fact. So even for that, such conditions, this is equally associated with river oxaban or even with dabigatran as well. So this is something really nice in that. So as we all know that dabigatran is indeed a direct thrombin inhibitor. So I already said about it. So it was approved by European Medical Agency in 2008 itself it on 2010 by the US FDA okay so we all know it is uh, it's a great medicine not only for prevention of stroke and systemic embolism and non valvular atrial fibrillation but also for treatment of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and also preventing their recurrence actually so even if someone has gone already undergone elective total hip replacement surgery or total knee replacement surgery as well, when you are thinking of prevention of venous thromboembolism episodes as well, so you may consider using all these drugs. So we must know this, the, what is the, one of the significant limitations is if a patient is on, is having valvular heart disease or on mechanical valve prosthesis that is definitely the time you should still think for vitamin k antagonists otherwise definitely noax are there if someone is unsuitable for noax as well they are having some problems you can think of left atrial appendage occlusion devices now coming to the dosage how much doses for whom actually so we need to understand if a patient is renally compromised, always try to use the minimum dosage. However, if there is a patient who is already uh, having a risk factor like the DVT or the pulmonary embolism, then you should use the higher dosages. However, if uh, you are trying to reduce their risk, just only for plain risk reduction, you may think of using a lower dosage for this. So which will be 110 mg. And it can be started like 1 to 4 hours after the surgery in fact. Did you understand? So always the higher dosage should be used, okay, in AF, DVT as well, okay. But when you are trying to use it for prophylaxis, 
when the surgery has been done not for the treatment but i mean as when surgery has been done but you are trying to do a little bit of prophylaxis that is the time you can try to use the low, lower dosage otherwise 150 dosage is the standard but yes as i had said it uh, what is happening is if there's a elderly gentleman if someone is also you have to be careful about the usage of verapamil if someone is using verapamil as well one will be having higher risk of bleeding in fact so how do you switch from the warfarin if someone is on already on warfarin so what you do is stop the warfarin repeat the ayana when the ayana becomes less than two then initiate dabigatrin thing is stop the warfarin once the ayana falls below two that is the time you can immediately start up the drug but yes you may have to wait for a little bit longer if the patient's creatine uh, or kidney functions are already a little altered so how do you take care from the parenteral anticoagulation so for example so the easy thing is if someone is already on injection heparin or something so whenever is the next dose is scheduled, what you can do is just 0 to 2 hours before the timing of the next dosage, you can do that, okay? Now, then comes is, how about the continuous infusion? Continuous infusion, what you do is, at the time of the discontinuation, okay? So whenever you are already taking that, giving that medicine, when do you stop? Wherever is the next dosage when you are supposed to stop, you will just stop it. There is no problem or no confusion about that at all. Then, a common question is, when you are sub when you are thinking of planning up a surgery with dabigatrin, when do you do that? So, one to two days is enough. But yes, in renal functions, which is if it is compromised, then you can wait for three to five days. Now coming to the tests which you can use. So what are the tests which you can use for the monitoring of dabigatrin? So they are APTT, ECT as well, but not anti 10 assay because we all know this is a direct thrombin inhibitor. But rivaroxaban, apixaban and idoxaban as well, they are factor 10 a inhibitors in fact. And that is the reason for the other uh, uh, drugs you can try to use factor anti 10 and SA. So, why INR is not used? Why INR is not used for testing of dabigatron or any of the NOACs? Because INR testing depends upon the vitamin K antagonists, but none of these drugs are vitamin K antagonists, and this is one of the reasons it's of no use right this was one of the early studies the earlier studies focused more on venous thromboembolism and trying to compare dabigatrin versus warfarin so we can see the risk of major bleeding intracranial bleeding and also non-major bleeding was lesser with the uses of dabigatrin similarly remedy study as well showed the same thing and it was a major study in the sense it was carried out in 33 countries then later came the resonate study as well so which was having more than almost 1350 patients and one of the path breaking studies was rely study so rely study as we all know it had appeared also in new england journal of medicine and it was carried across 45 countries employing more than 18,000 patients in fact so in that when they try to see for example with uh, even in dabigatrin there were two dosages 110 versus 150 so they all said it most of the times in fact that when we try to see for the complication rates like systemic embolism so best was with 150 similarly hemorrhagic streak as well it was least with the 150 
although for major bleeding the risk was least with the 110 milligrams so this is the other reason as well you should be aware 110 milligram should be used for what condition and 150 milligram should be used for what condition as well so there is no doubt about it 110 milligram is superior with warfarin although 150 milligram dabigatran was superior to warfarin with respect of systemic or embolism or even stroke as well so in the real world data of the dabigatran another multi-central registry as well so when they try to include almost like 555 non-valvular atrial fibrillation patients as well even in that they had observed similar rates so dabigatran has been proving quite a lot of significant superiority for over at least for the warfarin for sure so that's what had been happening then in that as well it was it in similarly to the rely population as well they also saw the major bleeding risk or rate of the dabigatran 110 milligram was significantly lower in fact okay so a lot of times i think we all come across patients of af who need the percutaneous intervention and during that when they try to compare dual therapy with dabigatran and one clopidogrel itself and no aspirin actually and the triple therapy triple therapy so what was the triple therapy was the old age thinking like warfarin plus ticagrelor or, or clopidogrel plus aspirin so in that when they try to see so what they observed was the risk for major bleeding was almost 50 percent lower for dabigatran 110 mg and an almost in fact 28 percent lower with when 150 milligram dual therapy in fact and of course dual therapy was non-inferior to the triple therapy as well with respect to the risk of thromboembolic episodes so what it means is dual therapy with dabigatran and just one clopidogrel or ticagrelor is as effective as the triple therapy in fact and then so when they similarly they try to see for the effectiveness and safety of the abigatron versus acinocumerol so they also found that okay prevention of stroke may be comparable but when it comes to the major bleeding risk it is significantly less with the dabigatran higher dosages and due to all these things it really made its way into the guidelines so it has been uh, included in the 2014 acc aha guidelines for the management of patients with atrial fibrillation and also the who essential medicines list as well and in fact even in 2016 esc guidelines for the management of af uh, which was made in association the eacts so what is eacts european association of cardiothoracic surgeons so even in this as well it was included and it was perceived very well in fact and the other guidelines as well the nice guidelines then the american academy of family physicians the american college of chest physicians as well and as we all know so this is the time frame how the studies uh, those landmark trials have been trying to prove so initially they tried to compare with aspirin yes uh, they have been better then in fact even with uh, uh, they tried to show that dabigatran is at least as effective i'm so sorry as effective as vitamin k antagonists in the setup of the atrial fibrillation as well and finally those a lot of those meta-analysis has been coming up which i showed you two of my own papers as well so in which the meta-analysis shows that NOACs are safer and also slightly more effective compared to the vitamin k antagonists okay but one common question what is the most common side effect of the dabigatran actually anyone would like to try 
So what is the common side effect actually for this? So even in my last session as well, uh, when we were speaking about uh, the NOAX, neural anticoagulants, so in that, those slides as well I had highlighted. So what happens is gastritis is a very common side effect which tends to happen with this. Okay. So the other thing as well what we all need to be aware is whenever I had already said it, especially if there is a patient on no acts, especially river oxaban, you need to be a little bit careful for its renal function and always better to ask the patient to take with food or even immediately after food. So it will raise, raise the bioavailability. And that is one of the reasons, although you have to give a really higher dosage. So does anyone remember for river oxaban, what are those dosages which you give? So for river oxaban, there are two dosages available, 15 milligram and 20 milligram. But for this, it is 110. 150 isn't it so much high so that's why it is so what happens is its bioavailability is really less so that is why now things have been changing to summarize over the past 50 years instead of vitamin k there are a lot of many newer and better drugs with better safety profile as well which are called as noax and in fixed dosages, you can have a much better predictable success rate as well. And Debigatrin has a pretty ideal uh, anticoagulant. And why is it ideal? Because, as I had said it already, that it does not undergo cy cytochrome B450 metabolism. It has really less drug to drug and drug to food interactions. Also, it does not require frequent lab monitoring of clotting parameters. Similarly, lower bleeding risks compared with the other anticoagulants. And now, what is happening is clinical trials comparing warfarin with each dabigatrin shows there is lower risk of hemorrhage, especially hemorrhagic stroke or intracranial bleeding, also life-threatening major bleeding. So, in real world data, actually, poor dapigatrin dosages are effective and also bleeding risk rates in patients with AF are even 